So, welcome to Taming Tech, the podcast. This is episode number seven, and you can find all the show notes at taming.tech forward slash seven. Hi, Tim, and welcome to Taming Tech, the podcast. Hi, Paul. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Okay, so for listeners and viewers of this podcast, because you can go and watch this on YouTube too, Tim Dragon is one of the developers, the writers, and as the kids say, and people much cooler than I would say, the OG of the DMARC standard, and also the founder of Demartian. What? Okay, first question. This is going to be a hard question, so brace yourself. Did you feel that DMARC was a needed thing, or did you feel that IT people just needed another acronym? Uh, a little bit of both. Um, I think the world needs DMARC, <laughs> but most of the time people get stumped by three letter acronyms. So we were like, how do we fuck with everyone and make it super long? But Paul, <laughs> it backfired because when people go on the internet for, I don't know, 10 years or so, people would type in DMARC and the number one hit was the Des Moines Area Religious Council. And so Google support team. Okay, like, yes, that is a problem. You need to deploy DMARC. And then people are like, Google's converting me in Des Moines, Iowa? I don't understand. <laughs> Super conflicting. Suck. Yes, no, look, I think, I think between RT people and acronyms and abbreviations and technicalities, they actually just like it to, to feel superior sometimes to other people. <laughs> they don't feel superior, man. That's just the way it is. Okay, that's just <laughs> the way it is. But... But on all seriousness, what, what are the advantages of businesses getting their SPF, DKIM, DMARC records sorted and, and sorted yeah, now? Uh, the acronyms don't matter. Uh, email's been around forever. Everyone's always been able to just make up any email they want. The content could be arbitrary. And you just send it out to the world and say, hey, world, figure out what the hell this thing is. All DMARC, I'm sorry, all the acronyms do is make it so that a piece of email could be linked back to an internet domain. That, that's all it does. Okay. And then the domain owner who's sending email can say, I'm doing this thing. Check my email for the thing. And if it doesn't pass, just don't even accept it. Just block it. And that's the basic model. If you want me to talk acronyms, okay. I totally okay. can. Look, I mean, there's, there's various types of, of listeners and, and viewers of this podcast. There's, there's people who are business owners and there's very technical people. So in terms of, of business owner who doesn't understand stuff, they, they know that their emails are going into someone else's spam and they, they, they're listening to this and going, why on earth? I'm, I'm a good person. Why is this happening to me? Why is it? Yes. So why is it happening to them? I mean, there's, there's millions of answers, but I think, I think if we could break it down for them in that kind of way, that will allow them to say, okay, I've ticked box number one. I'm not going to tick box number two, and I have no idea what box number three yeah, is. Yeah, that's a, that's a solid place to start. So if you're a business owner, even if you're not a business owner, if you're just a person that doesn't want to get defrauded on the internet, uh, in the days of old, someone had to take an interest in you and say, Tim, you're in Western North Carolina, and I've got a pipe fitting shop. Not too many people on the internet are going to fly to my town and break up my window and steal my pipe fittings, because no one gives a crap. However... Yeah. The internet makes everything different. You don't have to come to my hometown to break into my shop. You can just go online. And even worse now is that there's so much social networks. There's so much social media where everyone is putting everything online. All you have to do is pay attention and say, I'm going to go to LinkedIn or whatever social network and say, Tim's pipe fitting shops. What's the name of the admin? What are they used for banking? And then just send a piece of crap email that says, can you pay this invoice from the bank? And by the way, I'm the admin. And it doesn't even matter. Yes. It's so cheap to do all that. Machines do all the work of finding the intelligence now. It's just using legitimate technology in a criminal way. It's so cheap you can send a million of these kind of messages to everybody around the world. And even if a hundred of them click on it, your bank account just shoots out the roof from free, easy money. That's how shitty it is for people. And so the that that, that is pretty shitty, yes. And so the best thing to do is do basic internet security. One, don't be online but you have to be online to do anything. So if you have an internet domain, do the basic controls, make sure you have something. Well, there's only one thing like DMARC, do DMARC so that when you send a real piece of email, anybody else who cares to see if you're real or not can say, oh, uh, your email actually does come from you. That means I'm not gonna put you in the spam folder. I'm gonna deliver it and it makes it 
far easier for me, the person who's trying to figure that out, to understand what's real or not. Granted, big asterisk, you know, big footnote at the bottom of the page is if you send email that no one wants, if you're a spammer or you thrive on just flooding the internet with crap mail, hoping that someone's going to click on your bullshit drug pill email or whatever and buy some crap from you, it's probably going to be bad for you because everyone's going to say, wow, that person's really sending a lot of email that no one wants. And thank you for identifying yourself so we can all block all the crap yes. that no one wants. So if you're a good actor, definitely do it. If you're a bad actor, definitely do it so that everyone can understand that you're a bad actor. <laughs> but either way, you're going to have to do the work anyway because no one has time anymore yes. to sort through the big unknown pile to find the little needle that, you know, that's supposedly important. But it comes from someone who just doesn't care enough to actually do the minor amount of work it takes to make sure that they're not a needle in a haystack. So that's the way it's happening. Okay. So now if I'm, if I'm a business owner, if I've got a, a, a domain and I want to sort of like figure this stuff out, I think there's, there's a couple of ways. Obviously we can go to demartian.com um, and we can, we can type our domain number, uh, domain number really Paul domain name yeah. in there. And it will tell us a couple of things. It will tell us, are we covered by SPF? It will tell us if we're covered by DKIM. And it will tell us if we're covered by DMARC. There's a couple of other ones that, are, that I've used for email deliverability in the past, which is a, a website called MailGenius.com and Mail-Tester.com, which I'll put both of those in the, in the show notes. What they do is that you can actually get a, a temporary email address from them and you email that, that email address. And then it basically looks at the headers of your email. It says, okay, you know what? We've actually got uh, proper return senders. We've got proper uh, DMARC records, DKIM records. But you know what? You actually have no unsubscribe in your email or you've got um, a bad reputation on the internet. Where, would, where should people start? Where should – because – they might be listening to this going, I'm, I'm, I'm scared now. I want to look at it. Where should people yeah. start? Um, Paul, the two, there, there's two different problems that, that you've been talking about. The email tester stuff is great. Easy place to start. Uh, hmm. Most of the time, people will send themselves email to their favorite HTML-based web provider, you know, a Gmail or Yahoo or Hotmail or whatever. They'll send themselves email. Yes. They'll look at it and they'll say, I want to look at the headers to figure out what's going on. But immediately, that means you're not a normal person. Because normal people don't look at yes. email headers. So using one of those services that... Is, <laughs> what are you saying about me, Tim? I am normal. God, I'm normal. Say it. You're normal, I guess. I don't <laughs> Thank know. Thank you. But, but the, the thing is, uh, using those services make it, you know, it's, it's accessible to normal people to say, what does my mail look like when I send, that, when I send it to you? Uh, but that only works for the email that you're sending to those test addresses. Uh, something like DMARC... Yes. It's useful for the internet domain owner, especially at a small business or larger, because when you turn on DMARC and you go through the process, you get visibility into all the legitimate people that are trying to send email on your behalf. And the whole work is get visibility, work with your vendors so they send legitimized email using DMARC, and then you can flip the switch that says, if you get any piece of email that comes from my domain, um, you know, accept it if it checks, but otherwise block it if it doesn't. And so it's really two different contexts uh, for the thing. So yes. if you're going to get started as an individual and you don't own your own internet domain, DMARC is not for you. You don't even have to think about it. But if you do register your own internet domain, uh, take the little bit of time it takes to put some DMARC controls in place. And there's a number of different services. Um, when, when DMARC was first launched in 2012, uh, I realized that no, but nobody in the internet would develop. Well, sorry, nobody in the internet internet would deploy this stuff unless there was some kind of support resource. And if you turn on DMARC yes. by default, you get blasted with you know hundreds of pieces of XML from all around the the internet every day, and it's it's just not right. And so people try that. They turn it on. They're like, why is this weird thing like punching me in the <laughs> face all the time? Like, don't do that. Machines are supposed to process yes. it. And DMartian was the first a thing online that could process DMARC XML data. But the, the point is not to make a monopoly. The point is to spread DMARC everywhere. So there's many, many different services out there uh, that could meet your needs. So look at three of them. You know, take as much time as you want to find the right kind of vendor. There's there's something for everybody yes. out there after 10 years of advocating it and just trying to get people to do it. Okay, so now IT security in a, in a normal company is is 
multi-layered. It's rather than just having antivirus, which was the ultimate thing in, I don't know, 1998. It's, it's now we need firewalls and anti-malware and group policies and, 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 and. In email deliverability, the, as you said, the, um, we've got SPF, we've got DKIM, we've got DMARC, and all of those things have come over the years. Obviously, DMARC is, is one of the newer ones coming from about 2015, yeah. I think. Um, so that is another layer in terms of, of email security. And obviously, if, if I said to you that the first step in email deliverability and, and protecting your domain would be SPF, then maybe the second would be DKIM, and then the third would be DMARC. Would you agree with that, putting it in that kind of thing? Because obviously DMARC relates to the SPF and DKIM yeah, records. I, I, that's how it evolved historically, but that's not the right way to do to do it today. Um, couple okay. of, here's a series of fun facts. Uh, SPF came out in I like fun facts. 2004, 2005. It's just a way to use the DNS. You, know, you could publish a small list of servers on the internet that are that, that are okay to send on behalf of your domain, uh, specifically the envelope domain of a message, which confuses everybody. Uh, but anyway, that came out in 2004, 2005. No one gave a crap about it um, until Hotmail said, hey, if you want to deliver your email to Hotmail, if everybody remembers, you know, Hotmail, um, 2006, <laughs> I think they said, you need to make an SPF record if you want to get your email delivered. So all of a sudden, big, big day, everyone's like, crap, I need to put in an SPF record because I need to send my newsletter or whatever to my buddies at Hotmail. And so everybody did it. Yes. So that time, everyone tried their best, but they had no idea. They're like, I have an email server and I have a domain. I'm going to tell the world my email comes from my email server because it's obvious. But what they didn't think was they're not the only ones using that domain. So in 2006, a bunch of SPF records came about, arguably accurate, you know, for, for a few, few people. And, it, and that was it. And then SPF never goes away. Instead, people who have to maintain SPF change jobs, they quit, and then people show up at a new office and they're like, oh, I need to do something with SPF. So they just keep adding things. They just add more and more stuff to their SPF records. Super bad, not accurate. An email receiver can't yes. really trust the results. If they work and it looks like, you know, syntactically things are good, then great. They have a signal that they could use for their existing anti-spam engine. But, you know, publishing an SPF record, it's still just like, you know, you pinch your nose, you close your eyes, and you're like, I hope this helps. But I can't really tell if it does anything, but it feels good. And someone told me to do it. Okay, fast forward a couple of years. Okay. DKIM comes around. But let me, let me, jump, let me sure. jump in just quickly on that one. So we, we're actually going to be talking about the top 100 companies in South Africa and, and the way that their um, DMARC records and the DKIM and the SPF are actually set up and what kind of percentages are actually compliant. Um, touching on the SPF records now, one of the things that I noticed when compiling all this data was a lot of them actually are compliant with the SPF because you would hope that they are because it was from 2004. Um, but a lot of them have actually just added and added and added. And some of them are on 11 um, or 12 different things for their SPF, their different yeah. includes. Um, they haven't done a flattening of their of their SPF or anything. It's just they went, oh, we've added a new mail sender, so we're going to add that as an include. We now send from Microsoft 365, so we're going to add that. We now also send from um, whatever, a bulk mail server, SMTP to go or something. Yeah. And they just start adding all of these includes. What, what can people actually do to actually stop that kind of thing? I... I touched on mail flat, um, yeah. SPF flattening a little bit, but is that the best thing? Or should they actually do an audit once a year of actually what's in their SPF records? Yeah, uh, an audit once every year, once every 10 years. You know, any audit would be better. So, any, uh, yeah. so, so the difficulty with SPF is because in 2006, everyone needed it. And there's just a bunch of bad advice on how, like, why people should add their MailChimp. Like, include MailChimp, <laughs> even though by default, MailChimp yes. doesn't even send email in a way where it, where it makes sense. So people end up with SPF records that are huge that include things that should not be in there. Um, if you, if you, you know, like put on your, your weird security researcher hat, I guess it's more like this. If you put on your internet security <laughs> researcher hat that's very pointy, <laughs> you have a security envelope where people are just adding more and more authorized stuff and your envelope is fast and now yes. you're authorizing half the internet to send on your behalf. So the audit part, it's probably not optional. 
if you even want to take that a little bit seriously just look at it and just cut out the parts that are clearly not not supposed to be there but that's the crux of the problem is people don't know what should be there or not because there has been no feedback loop saying this is what looks legitimate coming out of your systems and people in one office often have no idea what's being sent from other offices or other lines of businesses and so it, it's been a big problem okay so so spf is a thing Okay, so that that was step number one was yeah. SPF, and then you were going on to the DKIM records. DKIM came second. It was a, a bastard hybrid between Cisco's uh, Cisco identified email and Yahoo came up with um, domain keys, and they were very very similar. And I think it's because Yahoo headquarters and Cisco headquarters are really close to each other in California. So same idea probably happened at one bar. Someone overheard it, and then just parallel implementation <laughs> tracks. They fought a little bit like only people in Silicon Valley can. And then they decided to hug yes. and make up because California is really soft like that. It's really nice. They came together and DKIM <laughs> was born. So they're like, they didn't want to budge. So it's domain keys, identified mail. So it was like the two technologies crammed together. Oh. And then they came together and made a lovely thing. In 2007, that's what it was. DKIM's a little bit different. It, you take the message, you give it, you know, I'm completely paraphrasing. You give it a... I'm okay digital with thumbprint that says this really does come from a domain and it's great it travels with the message so that you know you're not authorizing servers but rather you're saying this message has a thumbprint that travels with it and as long as you don't mess with the message or add stuff to it or take something away it still works it still can be checked which is great yes the problem there is is still the same that people would use the technology they'd go to their corporate email sender and say i'm sorry their corporate email server put the technology in yes. place so they had one stream of email using the domain that's decom signed and they'd say we're done but they forgot about their newsletters they forgot about all the other email that's using that email domain and so yes. from a receiver's perspective sometimes a, a bank's email would, would authenticate correctly sometimes a bank email would not it was still up to the receiver to figure out what was real or not which is completely crappy from a protect your users perspective right the Gmail team has to inspect yes. every message to try to figure out, is this thing real? Or is it like a dangerous, dangerous fake that looks super real? Um, and it just, it leads to a really bad situation. So DMARC, you know, the last acronym, better acronym because it has more letters. That one came along. <laughs> the problem was, how do you get people, how do you give domain owners information that they can use to deploy SPF and DKIM accurately? And so that's what DMARC adds to the whole thing is, you get a feedback loop where the rest of the internet says, here's how we see your domain being used at our own front door. And you put all those front doors together, you process it as a big blob, and you pull out you know, the infrastructure that's like, you know, here you're using Gmail's infrastructure for your corporate stuff, you're using MailChimp for your newsletters, and you're using you know, a payroll company, and they're all sending using your domain. Yes. Then you can go through and deploy SPF and DKIM to such a degree of accuracy that you could throw the switch and say, I've done the work block anything that doesn't come from me and receivers then can really trust it and the important thing is the receivers can trust you but more importantly from their perspective is if there's ever a support issue they can just say oh you're doing dmark and you have a reject policy you have a problem with that internet domain go to the sender and stop talking to us about why your stuff's ending up in the spam folder so it's made this really beautiful yes. kind of uh uh ecosystem this feedback loop where domain owners can now have responsibility for what it is that they're sending and they get to deal with the support costs for their own behavior which is really really brilliant yes okay so now there are three levels of dmark there is none there is quarantine and there is reject right. so none is basically where everyone starts with That's dmark right. it basically you put a, a none record in and then then everyone who gets emails from you or any server that gets emails from you will then start sending xml yeah, things right. back to the reporting yeah, address people sometimes call that okay, so monitor mode and it was designed monitor so you mode. can turn it on and collect data without anything being affected so you can turn the light on it's okay you might see something horrible but it's not going to change the way things yes. are currently going so you can get started as just a technician you can turn it on collect data and do things without getting an angry phone call on Saturday night from the boss being like, what have you fucked up? Yes. So now with this, with these top 100, which we'll talk about just now, there's a couple that have got the none, a couple that have got the quarantine and a couple that have got the reject. Yeah. There's also a couple that have got nothing. Right. In my opinion, that's 
inexcusable. They, they're not even trying. They're not even monitoring. They're not seeing what's actually happening with their domain. They're not seeing if their domain is being spoofed. They're not seeing if there's a whole bunch of people sending mails to possibly their clients and they're not monitoring it. They're not getting any feedback from it. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's any malicious intent there because I'm an idealist fundamentally. I believe that the only reason why that's the way it is, is because people aren't aware of it. Yes. But you know, you know, in that, that old saying that in, in the eyes of the law, um, ignorance is not a defense. I'm unfamiliar with that. <laughs> because that's Igno yeah, ignorance. <laughs> it, it, it's something, it's something like that. Ignorance is, is in, oh, something. Well, I, said, anyway, those who are I, I, I get the irony of you not knowing no, that. No, that's not quite right. <laughs> it's, it's something about meek and there's, there's animals involved. I'm not sure. Anyway. So in terms of, in terms of being an IT person, there's a couple of roles that an IT person needs to have and one of the roles in my in my opinion is that they need to be a researcher they need to be a learner they need to be a an understander of new technologies yeah. because if someone deployed microsoft exchange in the year 2000 and went cool i'm done now and 20 years later hadn't done anything else about it in my opinion that's inexcusable that's almost neglig um, yeah. negligent yeah i agree um so if DMARC was released last month, I'd go, cool, they, they, they're okay, they, they haven't read the articles, they've been busy, whatever they have. DMARC is from 2015, that's six years. And in IT oh, circles, that's a long interrupt. time. DMARC is from 2012, so it's even worse. Okay, okay, so that, that, that is definitely worse, yes. Okay, so if I, if I was to say to someone, I haven't done my DMARC records, because I didn't know about them. Um, it's brand new. In 2012, I'd be okay with that. Maybe 2013, 14 at a push, but I don't think so anymore. Yeah, uh, it, I think it comes down to, if people haven't done it yet, there's probably lack of a carrot, lack of a stick, lack of awareness. I don't know. I spent the first, I don't know, 2012 to 2015 flying around telling people and evangelizing and saying, this is a really neat technology until someone put me on the shoulder and said, so we need to sit down. We know it's there. You know, it's happening. It's, it's going to be okay. And I realized like, wow. Yeah. Listen, Tim, calm down. We all know and we yeah, get it. Exactly. Thank like, you. Change your stick, dude. Move on to the next acronym. <laughs> but I'm like, this is all I know. So come on. Help me. Yeah. Out. Yeah. This is, this is going to be carved on my gravestone. I, I'm, I'm called the DMARC. Oh, no, no. I just want a quiet life. Why am I even <laughs> on your podcast? I don't want to be known for anything, DMARC. I just want to quietly... <laughs> play electronic music and ride mountain uh, bikes. I'm, do, I'm doing the wrong thing. That sounds brilliant. We will just take a break now and sort of like, just do sounds that. <laughs> we'll just, yes. Um, okay. So let's, let's jump in here. Let's jump in here. There's a couple yeah. of things. If, if they don't have DMARC in, involved, there's a couple of, of negatives. Let's start with the, the stick. There's spoofing, there's privacy laws, there's hacking, there's phishing, there's all of those things that can actually happen if they don't have SPF, DKIM, and especially DMARC right. put in. Are there any things that I'm missing yeah. there? Are there any other sticks that you yes. have? Yes, uh, from a technical perspective. Um, that I have a different way of saying this, but I swear it's related. There are different drivers okay. for why people have deployed DMARC. Originally, it was the the phishing problem, you know, CEOs, executive yes. teams, oh God, we've got something horrible and we just send $50,000 somewhere we shouldn't have gone, you know, oh God, what do we do? <laughs> Shit rolls downhill. The IT person's like, you need to fix this. The IT person says, oh crap, I'm going to do my job or, or fix this fire. What do I do? Uh, DMARC looks like the thing because, you know, they read the magazines and, and are on top of blogs. They try to get the work done. Um, that's the, that's number one driver. And it really lifted DMARC from being nothing to being something, something good. Um, the, the yes. other driver at the same time was for deliverability. You know, if you're trying to send your newsletter, make it so that people can identify you makes delivery a little bit easier, you know, avoid some of the dangerous spam engine stuff if you can. So, but that was a really minor, minor thing. Um, what we're seeing now is that regulation is taking up the slack. So instead of having to wait for everybody to be defrauded before they take action, 
um, industry associations and governments are, are stepping in and saying, you need to do this thing. Um, I thought in the United States this wouldn't happen forever because the United States government is really bankrolled. Like you have to have money to make something happen. And if you're an internet inter interoperability standard, you don't have any money by definition. You're not even a thing. You're just a, a way to work together. So who's going to pay everybody yes. to get to be a regulation? Nobody. But it happened. The United States has got stuff rolling through the federal government from the legislative branch that says the U.S. has to do this. And all of a sudden... We don't have to wait for everybody to, everybody to be uh, to be defrauded anymore, which is really really great. That's the next big driver. The last one that we're seeing is, uh, from a compliance perspective, um, insurance companies are starting to look at all the different data breaches, and because they've been authoring policies for cybersecurity insurance, people are getting their asses kicked, and now they're like, my policy should pay for something. So insurance companies are now saying, oh, you don't even have a DMARC record. You know, they don't even have to look at the company or if they have doors in their locks from their office, they can just use their internet browser and be like, click, click. You don't even have this basic signal in place for keeping your pants on. And you want us to pay you for, you know, for what happened to you. That's ridiculous. So that by far is driving, um, DMARC adoption in today's modern world, more than people being defrauded and more than an IT person being, we've got a firewall and all this other stuff. It's mainly, we're not going to get any of our insurance money or, you know, so we have to go do this thing. Um, That's amazing. I haven't heard about yeah, that it, one. It's, it, I've heard about everything else, but the, but the insurance one is completely wonderfully it, evil. It's, it's the culmination of technology advocacy. I think you have to push technology to the point where insurance companies get involved or financers. <laughs> if you could somehow tie your thing to how financers rule the world, then like your technology is going to be baked in everywhere. Cause that's just the way it goes. Yeah, and if you can get the, the insurance and the financial people to talk together, you will basically be a... Yeah, yes. we're talking about taking anyway. over governments and stuff now. But let's get away from the weird yes, Illuminati no, okay. stuff. And, uh, <laughs> Paul, there's one, there's, yeah, there's no, one last thing I could share about barriers, which is when people try to get DMARC done, mainly it's a technical person who's been told by an angry C-level executive, like, how can you let me do a bad thing? You need to fix this. You need to put DMARC in place. And they're like, oh, crap, what do I do? And then it comes down to you at a larger company, you have a domain that you need to put DMARC in place. You get your data, you do all the technical stuff, you get a list of vendors that you have to work for, work through to get DMARC compliance in place. A lot of time, this is the first time a technical person has ever had to leave their cube to go talk to like people in marketing and what like newsletter they're using. It's the first time they've had to talk to legal teams or vendor management teams. And it's super weird. And it's way outside of what they normally do and what they signed up for when they got into IT. So that in itself can be a, a big barrier of adoption to, to DMARC is letting technicians know that they can get the work done. It's just like no other work they've done before. Um, and so cracking that nut has been has been interesting for sure. Yeah, no, that, that does sound uncomfortable for people who haven't done it before. Yeah, so all, all we could do is, yes. you know, yes. Keep the sheets nice and tidy. Send them love. You know, we send them love. Clean, yes. Safe. Yes. And it's okay. Yes. Okay. Um, so, if you are okay, let's look at the top 100 um, companies. Yes. Um, so, okay. I, I'm not a data researcher. That's fun. Neither and am this I. This is going to work out quite well for us. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we've got the screen share thing going on. Um, all I've done is use uh, DMartians tools to dump in the top 100 companies and uh, I'm not trying to highlight the platform. I'm just sh showing that we've got domains on the left column. We have DMARC records in the middle and SPF records on the right. Uh, DKIM, I turn okay. that part off because if we don't have data collected from DMARC, can't really tell you much about DKIM. Um, because of the way DKIM okay. works, you just can't probe the internet to find results very easily. So we're just going to put those aside. Um, so sure. there are quite a few companies, uh, top 100 list, where there are reject policies in place. I think seven, you know, according to this this, this screen here. And they've got SPF. Okay. In place. Let's just let's just sort of like jump in here. We talk about the top 100 yeah. companies. Um, I pulled this from the top 100 um, stock market companies in South Africa. Some of them actually are listed twice or three times on the stock market and they use the same um, outgoing sending email domain. 
So there might only be 95 or something in here, but I'm sure we'll be able to figure that out going forward. Yes. yes. I won't be able to tell you about it, but um, that brings up an interesting okay. problem that a lot of companies have, which is they often think that their that their main domain is the only one that they need to put DMARC controls in place. When really, if you're the security person at a large company, you should be getting all of your domains in compliance with DMARC, even the ones that don't send email. So, you know, in terms of efficiency, don't do just one domain at a time. Roll the technology out all at the same time. It just ends up being more efficient. If, if someone is going to have a normal domain and an email sending domain, are they looking at having both of those domains protected or should you rather just protect your email sending domain? Well, uh, it's my understanding that if you're the CISO at a, at a company or even if you're in charge of just security for internet domains, it's far simpler to say, we have DMARC in place across the board, and that's just a matter of policy. Um, the, the, okay. the technical twist is not only is that you know, PR position better, but it's incredibly easy to put DMARC policies in place for emails that do not send domains. Uh, sorry, do not send emails. They're not being used. All you have to do is monitor data for a week, verify that they're not be, being used legitimately, and you put your controls in place and you're done. Just because, and the thing is, just because you don't use the email, I'm sorry, just because you don't use that domain for email doesn't mean fraud people, you know, aren't going to use them. So like, you should really... Absolutely, because if it, if it does say your domain name and I go, that's a, a known domain to me, and I get spoofed on that domain because you don't have your records in place, then it's quite easy to yeah, do it. Yeah, and, and the worst part is if it's a legitimate domain, you know, pe it, researchers on the internet are going to look and say, oh, this really does belong to, you know, BHP or whatever company, and, but it doesn't have yes. a DMARC record. And now, like, try to be the machines figuring out, it's like, is this a malware domain? No, it looks like it's registered to an, a real entity. So if we have to guess, you know, eh, maybe it's good. Let's put it in front of the user and let them figure it out. Better to put a DMARC policy yes. in place that explicitly says this domain does not send any legitimate email. It makes everybody's, it makes the good actor's jobs far, far easier. Okay, so in terms of the top, let's pretend it's yeah. 100, we have got like nine rejects, rejects, yeah, nine. which is the top yeah. security blocking. Right. Thing. Uh, far more in quarantine. Um, really, I'm going to drive towards the bottom yes. of the list because that's where it starts getting interesting. So quarantine is the second kind of mode that DMAR can be in. Basically means if you get a piece of email from my domain and it's not compliant, um, you know, scrutinize it. If you have a spam folder, throw it in the spam folder. Uh, if you don't have a spam folder construct, then really turn up the dials on your anti-spam uh, engines and really like, you know, give that message a, a what for, see if it's real or not. Um, but most of the time, quarantine is an intermediate step on the way to reject, which allows people to just block email that's not compliant outright. That's that's really where most companies want to okay. be. Okay, and then something like Hammerson, for instance, there says that they're going to quarantine and they're going to quarantine 50%. Yep. Is that is that a, a good way to do it? So, so go from none to quarantine a certain percentage, quarantine a hundred percent, and then reject. Yeah, the the percentage tag is um, uh, when DMARC was being developed. Uh, we knew that some really large companies didn't want to have the big four forty Frankenstein switch where they're like, okay, across the financial sector, let's throw this switch and see what happens. So the percentage tag is more like a volume dial where you can say, I want to I want to apply this policy to illegitimate email but I really don't want to do it, you know, all at once. So you could go from percentage to zero all the way to 100, um, more as a dial. In practice, uh, most companies will do the work. And by the time they get to the point where they're ready to put a policy in place, they go to quarantine, they wait a little while, and then they go to reject. Uh, the, the important thing isn't so much, you know, the technical, the technical control, the dial being in place. Rather, it's making sure that the organization has uh, remediation paths and some escalation paths in place. So if something does go wrong, you know, which it will at some point in the future, just make sure that people aren't bouncing off the walls trying to figure out what to do about it. Like build those escalation paths. So the controls are there in terms of percentage okay. to, to, give you, to give you some ability to say, don't roll this out 100% from the get-go. In my, in my perspective, it's far more important to make sure that the company is, knows how to respond to issues you know, build out that little minor operational process and then the percentage stuff becomes less important. 
Okay, so as we as we scroll down the, the list, we've got obviously quarantines, we've got a couple of SPF attention needed, which either there's too many includes in there, um, or they didn't actually set it up yep. properly. And then we get down to the nuns. Yep. Now, the first the first couple of nuns that I actually would like to talk about are there's quite a few banks mm -hmm. in here. Uh, there's Standard Bank, um, there's Ned Bank. Those are the ones that, you know, <laughs> Let me let me sort of like to take a step back. In South Africa, we have quite a few mining companies, and those mining companies might have a hundred thousand people working for them. But in those hundred thousand, there's only ninety thousand people who are actually miners, and only ten thousand or one thousand or whatever it is that are actually working in the right. office. And those people are actually only dealing with as a handful of suppliers and a handful of clients. If you're looking at something like a Standard Bank, if you're looking at uh, something like a Pepcor, for instance. Pepcor is a um, clothing brand, a clothing shop um, chain in South Africa. So if I'm going to be doing that, they have got accounts on their on their clothing things. They've got specials that are going out. They're going, uh, whatever it is, they've got millions of people on their mailing right. list. Sanabank, Nedbank, all of those have got millions and millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people on their mailing list and they have a DMARC record of none. Yes, they've got an SPF record that is um, there and they probably have a DKIM record, but they have a, a DMARC record of none. That, how does, how does this kind of percentage actually work in comparison with what you're seeing internationally? Are people looking at banks, are, are the banks internationally actually putting a, a DMARC record that's a, either a reject or a quarantine in place, or are they sitting on uh, that? It, it really depends on the bank. Um, larger banks that have dedicated security budgets and, and capable teams have already moved to put reject policies in place. Um, that said, uh, a lot of banks look at DMARC, they, they turn the records on, they start collecting data, as you can see by P equals none, um, but then they have a project yes. internally that says, oh, we need to roll these email security controls out. Um, a lot of times, though, the the value proposition, you know, either gets stuck or there's no one there to make it internally. Because DMARC, again, is just an interoperability standard. It's not a product. There's not a sales team or a vendor saying we need to push the security initiative forward, you know, unless you unless you talk to a DMARC uh, deployment company like DMartian. Um, there's just no one doing that. And when you even then, if you turn on the if you turn on the lights, if you collect data and you get a list of all the different vendors and offices, there might be so much technology sprawl that the company decides to say, we're going to tackle this initiative when we decide to clean up all of our technology sprawl because we can't do one without doing the other. And that just takes a really long yes. time at some companies. Um, you know, I, I get that. I get that. And, and with with 2020 and COVID and, and things like that, We've seen a lot of, of people approaching us to change their email systems. They changed from pop emails, IMAP emails to M365 to Google Workspace, whatever it is. And what we've also found, because there's a decentralized um, company, people are working from home, they are looking at their layers of security. And what we've found is that People are starting to get targeted. Companies are starting to get targeted, especially small companies. It's, it's obviously the big companies are being targeted too, but it normally was just the big companies. And we're starting to see a lot of, of smaller companies, 10 people, 20, 100, where they're starting to have their clients emailed and saying that you owe us money or the bank um, account has changed or whatever it is. And it looks like it's a legitimate email from their domain. Right. With with this, we then started putting nun records in all of them, so that we could actually see what's actually happening. And once you once you put that record in place, and you can actually see what's happening for the small companies, the ten hundred, even a thousand people in a company. Yes, that's that's going to be a, um, an effort to change it and and to to figure out: Are you using Mailchimp? Are you using M three sixty five? What are you right. using? If you're using 10,000, 20,000 people in a company and you're a bank and you've gone through 40, 50, 60 years of technology and you've acquired different companies and you've uh, brought on staff and things like that. I understand that they've got legacy systems that might be 20, 30 years right. old. 
And to change those legacy systems that are still running COBOL or whatever it is might be very, very hard. But when when is when is it going to happen? When when can we actually get out the stick and say, okay, it's twenty twenty one, it's twenty thirty, it's twenty forty. When when do they actually have to have this done yeah. by to actually keep up with the Jones? Yeah, I think um, well, that that's a great point. The thing the thing with email that keeps it interesting for me is that it's a free, essentially a free medium. Anybody could become an email player in any layer of the of the email stack. Um, and because of its open nature, uh, email is by far the largest online application. And so to change it, uh, it's not something that you could say, hey, on today, we're gonna say that, it, that, it, that it's just done. So that, the, the, yes. the size of the space keeps it interesting to me, but I just know, I, I still don't really understand what it means in terms of being a massively big number, but what it what it means from different company sizes is that a large bank does have the resources to roll this technology out. They do have the teams, and they've got access to the to the to the training and the expertise that they need to roll it out. But then they also have problems of priority and and you know whatever they they've got their own internal decisions that they can make. As the companies get smaller. Um, their access to resources gets more limited until you get to kind of a magic point where there is no dedicated uh, technologist that could take on this work. Even though it's just email, yes. email's been around so long that it's actually quite complicated how it, how it works. There's a lot of acronyms um, and it can be difficult to fix up, not because of the technology, but because there's a bunch of humans using it all the time in really creative and weird ways. As companies get smaller, um, we at Demartian our whole point is to get DMARC rolled out everywhere, but we're stuck as a company because we can only directly service uh, lar larger companies that have dedicated technical staff because that's 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 how our business has evolved and that's the only way we can do it. But the real issue from a from a technology deployment aspect for DMARC is that there are a bunch of internet domain owners in small businesses where their internet domain is used for things like a restaurant or you know, an accounting firm where they have nothing to do with really an online presence. They just have to be online to, to, to do their work. You know, if that makes sense, right? Yes. They're using the tools, but their business yes. is not internet facing. So how do you get them to deploy DMARC? And we tried doing a direct sales model to them, but we just can't hire 100,000 support people to help people cut and paste, you know, DNS changes into their, into their DNS software. It's just not practical. And there's no technology that makes that easy today. So at Demartian, we have to work with managed service providers and the managed security service providers that augment teams because they're the ones that can actually get the work done. Um, so for change to happen, because of the compliance in the, in the legal and the regulation drivers actually having things happen, people don't care so much now why they need to do DMARC. Really, they're coming about like, how do they do it? You know, is there someone that they yes. could call on the phone right now to say, uh, I need to do this thing, you know, support just told me i need to do dmark and it's not the religious council in iowa i called them they said that they're not actually the thing so who do you call now everybody who's got a small business calls up their technology provider you know that that service yes. provider gives them a cash machine you know they've got their their printer paper the receipt paper or whatever they got their voip system and they get email in a like a crappy website they're the ones that need to be able to provide the the dmark deployment part because they're already supporting all the other technologies so so how do you get all those all that work done you know in a year <laughs> i have no idea but i we've yeah. got i we've been throwing ourselves at it for long enough where we know that there is an end in sight um and eventually it'll probably happen pretty quick once a major mailbox provider says okay we've read the critical path now and even more so when they flip the switch that you have to do it the wave of people who need help can actually get help that's really what it comes down to Okay, so we've spoken, we've spoken a little bit about how the, the person internally is going to start freaking out, which is which yeah. is fine, they need to freak out just a little bit. But people are going to look at the top 100 and, and look at how many people are, are on the none and we haven't even looked at the at the people who haven't even done any DMARC yeah. records. What is what is your preemptive rebuttal? When someone reaches out and says, Oh, I've got um, something. What What is the argument that they're going to say? I, it's too big. 
Um, we've got 100,000 people. We've got 400,000 services. We've got COBOL systems. What is, what is the rebuttal that you have for them to say, you know what, you need to be better? Yeah, um, we've actually had that. We've sat down with CISOs, and they're super busy. You know, CISOs are an interesting role at large companies. They're in charge of security. They almost always come up from a, a very strong technical background. But as a C-level executive, they have to talk like a, like a business person with an MBA. And so they're, they're a bit schizophrenic. Yes. So when we sat down with them and we say, hey, you've got you know, 400 internet domains. These are all of your public assets. They're just hanging out on the internet and they don't have any basic security you know, in terms of email. This is your ass on the line. Um, our first pitch was like that, but then the CISOs, of course, don't like being told that they have got exposure on the internet. So they say it's an impossible problem. No one could solve that. And so we show them a dashboard like this. And we say, like, no, we, like, we can help you. This is not really that big of a deal. Yes. Here's all of your internet domains. Here's the, here's the progress. You know, your company is so large, probably can take you six months just of human time to march through the project. But flip it all the way around. In six months' time, do you want a really nice list of all the assets that are in, on the internet with, like, you know, all green saying that you've got this strong email protection in place? just as like, you know, a policy. And they're like, wow, uh, that sounds like a good way to preserve my job. So we have yes. to- And we like the color green. Uh, uh, yes, green really sells. And <laughs> if you know what I mean. And if you flip it all the way around, you know, of course we stumbled through all this just learning. And now we, now we flip it all the way around and position it the right way. It's like, we can help you manage this problem. Like, cause it's really about how do yes. people get the work done? We no longer have to argue that, you know, the ROI calculation for protecting your CEO is $50,000 a year and it's only going to cost you 45000 So you're saving $5,000. We no longer have to pitch stuff like that because of the regulatory uh, yes. aspect. Now it's like people are like, I need this. How do I do it? And, you know, if you're a small business, no one can afford to say, hey, small business, I'm going to hang out with you online and I'm going to help you cut and paste these, these text records, or I'm going to help you take a course in learning SPF because you should be an expert too. Yes. Like it's just, they're all non-starters when you try to do it a million times over. We can always scroll down and see more terrible stuff because it gets worse. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's, let's scroll down some more and, and get more terrible yeah. stuff. The good news is there's so much green because a lot of people are paying attention. Like the top 100 list is, yes. is actually not that bad. There's data being collected. But I bet people are stuck trying to figure out how do we do this. Um, we make no DMARC red, but you know it just means like they, they need to take some attention. So these companies here, if you're an outside insurance company, you look at this, you kind of feel they might have a security department, but they're not doing the basics. So what are they focused on? Like advanced yes. hardcore, you know, like laser satellites shooting like people jumping over fences or whatever. They're not doing the basics, which is arguably something that should be done first. What's interesting. On, okay, yeah. so so these are the ones that I'm, I'm kind of picking on, not just to be nasty, but to say these are the ones that the average person on the street is actually going to get interactions from. Um, there might be, okay, there's Barlow World and Fortress Fund. So Telcom, for instance, is our, our telephone yeah. suppliers. They um, do the landlines and things like that. So there are millions of people that are getting emails from telecom, for instance. And every time I get an email from telecom, it hits my spam folder every single right. time. And I can't then tell if telecom is actually a real email or it's a spam I, or a spoof or a whatever. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's some very big companies here, um, obviously the top 100s, but the needs attention, the errors or the not actually implementing it yeah. there um kind of scares the, me the the needs attention ones just what? to pull out some random ones um they, yes. they're trying to collect data uh but they're but they're not able to do it or there's just some basic syntax problems so so yes. technically someone's like yes we have a dmark record but an insurance company would look at it and be like you don't actually have any controls and it looks worse than having none it's kind of, it's probably yes. worse to do half-ass security than it is to do, you know, any. Okay, so yeah. there, there's a, there's here AB InBev. Um, I don't know. I think it's from a movie or something, but I bet a lot of South Africans drink. So AB InBev should probably protect their domain a little bit better. 
but they're not actually a South African domain here, and AB InBev is massive, so I'm not going to blame South Africa for yes. that one. Okay, still, thank you. Thank you, I appreciate and that. And they, they have a syntax error, yes. so someone took the time to make an update, but then they just walked away without seeing if it is actually working, which is bad. Um, but, Paul, I okay. think a lot of this is just email has been around for so long, everybody's using it. As long as it works 99.9% .9 of the time, most people are like that. That's just They're the okay. way it's always been done. Like email, if if you failed to deliver an email, it's designed to retry. So most people have been trained to be like, yes. oh, you didn't get that email. Uh, just wait a day, you know, and maybe it'll just kind of yes. fix itself. And if not, it wasn't no. really that important because I called you anyway, and now you've got the information. <laughs> so let's just keep going. And so I guess email yeah. suffers from a built-in resiliency. There are others where there are, are um, you know, the the ten lookup is is a problem. Most major receivers don't care about the 10 lookups because it's just been around for so long. They just they accept what it is and they keep on checking. But as a maintainer of the records, it means that no one's taking any time to keep things tidy. And they're just uh, they're basically saying we have a problem that we're not taking very seriously. And it's only a problem of security envelope in terms of email senders with, you know, email being the number one attack vector for malware. Eh, maybe we shouldn't pay too much attention to it. Yeah, so yeah, that's not that yeah, important. Who, who, yeah, who yeah. cares until someone does? But uh, so there, I honestly, I've been doing this for so long that I've gone through the the cycle of being pissed off and jaded, cynical, until I finally popped out and realized, like, <laughs> oh, you know, people just need help, and you know, like, yeah. it's really about finding the person that can take action within a company and saying, look, we're able to, we're here to help you, and if the person's like, I really want to do this, but I can't because of my management, that's an entirely different problem. Doesn't matter if it's a technology yes. problem; it's just human nature at that point and like good luck right okay so we like to compare ourselves against other people and other countries how how bad are are the top 100 companies in south africa versus other companies that you're seeing around um, the world we're looking at a percentage of let's say 10 percent of reject and let's say probably another 20 percent of quarantine yeah. Uh, I would say just slightly behind the curve, but it might be because most companies that have adopted DMARC already have a visible problem. Um, and so other countries might be heavy on public facing retail companies. So they might have a lot of big banks that dominate their top 100. And so um, it's probably more useful to look at on a sector basis. Uh, retail companies okay. that are publicly visible are already set up to, to think about their there's security in terms of brand protection and anti-counterfeiting, uh, sorry, anti-counterfeiting. And so they're already there. Uh, they're at a place already where they can look at DMARC as a, as a control that they need to take advantage of because they already have programs in place. The ones where adoption suffer the most are business to business companies that don't have that kind of existing problem. And so DMARC and email security is an entirely new thing. And the way that email security is currently sold into those kind of companies is that it very much is a firewall, protect your employees, you know, build a secure space for your workers um, and treat it like that. But the problem with DMARC as a control is that it's different. You're not adding to the firewall. It's a different, it's a different kind of uh, security solution that you can't easily procure. Hmm. I mean, you could get the data processing part pretty easily, but you can't easily hire a project manage, manager to fly into your company and start making changes to all your vendors. It's just very not like anything else that they've ever dealt with before. And, and, I, and I believe that's, that's why a lot of companies haven't moved, moved forward is because they just don't know what they're getting into. Well, you've definitely given people um, a nice thing to go, you know what, it's difficult. I'm not going to do it because it's difficult. It's a, it's a nice, happy word. Well, but, I, I probably spoke incorrectly. Yes. It's not difficult. It's just different from how most companies have procured what they consider to be security technologies, right? It's probably more like a business process yes. or, but that, that's why, I, that's why I'm about as excited as one could be about uh, a regulation or a, or a technology compliance thing coming from insurance companies. Like, yay, that really gets me hot and heavy. It's amazing. <laughs> but when you go to a large company and you don't say, oh, this is an email security solution that needs to be rolled out. They're like, you need to go talk to the IT team because they deal with, you know, the firewall and whatever else. And that team's like, oh, crap, this yes. is not like something we've ever dealt with before. The the compliance regime coming in saying you have something like ISO 27001 that needs to hook into that kind of series of controls. All of a sudden, this is no longer a problem. Like 
It's just yes. another dish on the buffet line that people need to come by and scoop occasionally. And it just ends it ends up being different. I think it's what it is right now is yeah. DMARC's currently stuck in email security land when really it, it's probably better to consider it as something else. Business security. Yeah, business security, compliance. Like it just when people can think about yeah. it correctly, it makes all those past problems into non issues. So a couple of things while we while we're finishing yeah. off here. Um I was when I was doing the research on on you and getting this podcast up and running, um, I was looking at, at some actual stats. There are four billion as of as of right now, there are four billion emailers, people who are emailing per year. Got okay? it. And that will go to about four point six billion by twenty twenty five. Right. There are three hundred and twenty billion emails sent per day. Now and there by 2025, 380 billion emails. Right. There are currently almost 3 billion people on Facebook. And as you know, there are probably at least two or three emails a week. So you're probably, they're probably sending out at least 3 billion emails a week from right. Facebook. MailChimp sends a billion emails a day, which blew me big. away. I thought MailChimp was big but i didn't realize how big and a billion emails a day is a lot the thing that that does make me a little bit happy in 2014 the percentage of the total email traffic was 71 percent total email traffic was 71 percent was spam as of 2021 it's 45 percent i think that comes down to a couple of things one i think people are getting better at blocking spam I think the regulations and standards that are in place, uh, like SPF, DMARC, DKIM, all of them are making it more difficult to actually send out spam messages. And hopefully it's it's on a downward trend. If you're going down to 45%, I hope it will get down even further. But we are sending more and more emails, so it's still a lot of emails that are going that are spam yeah. emails. Well um yeah, uh, I was just going to say for um, for a follow up episode, we can talk about the next wave of emails evolution, which has to be email clients. You know, web browsers yes. have the World Wide Web Consortium, but email clients don't have any kind of community. So everybody's using, you know, technology from the 1990s for their email clients and having to filter through stuff when arguably That's that true. part needs to be fixed. I would love to talk about that. That's but true. There's not enough acronyms in that space now for me to get involved. <laughs> I wanted to ask you though, with all of these, these emails that are going out, there's obviously standards and, and regulations that have been worked on. Obviously you've got the DMARC. What is the next layer that's coming out that is on the horizon? I mean, I've been reading about Beamy records and uh, Beamy record is a thing that is called a brand indicator message identification record where it does a little um, company logo inside your email inbox to say that the email is legitimate. And Beamy record is quite fun, except right now you have to have a trademarked logo to be able to upload a trademarked logo into an SVG to actually attach it to your website and say, this is actually what my domain is. So when that becomes a normal non trademarked logo, that will obviously be better and quite yeah. cool. Um, but what else are you seeing on the, on the horizon? Um, yeah, for B, for, for DMARC, you know, deployment is still the thing that has to happen, but let's, let's fast forward to when everyone in the world is sending DMARC compliant email. Um, yes. Uh, then it's, it's, it's all about people managing legitimate communications and then having their own kind of hyper local thing that they trust. You know, if you're in Russia dealing with Russian companies, your trust profile is radically different than if you're in Washington, D.C. in the defense industry, right? There's 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 no such thing as like, oh, I can trust you or not. It's all about context. So I think it's going to go in that direction. But in terms of developments uh, today, uh, Bimi is there providing logos. But as a technology, um, it faces some some headwinds in that you can get your logos displayed today by just making a Google profile or by creating a Microsoft um, 
business profile and adding your logos there. So companies have been doing that for a long time. So there's there's a headwind. Yes. So as a as a driver for DMARC, Bimmy's just not there. It's more like a nice uh, add on saying, hey, you've you've done DMARC. Now you get you know you can get your logos in in, in certain places if you you know you can do that. So uh, looking beyond DMARC, uh, in terms of uh, of of um, in, in terms of standardization of existing efforts, I don't think there's anything there except for people talking about how to do things like improve email clients because the problems are really moving to the human users and less as an interoperability problem. Hmm. Okay, so now with with DMARC, there's obviously the big players have, have bought into DMARC. The, the Gmail, the Google, the Microsoft, the Yahoo, all of them have bought into it. But in testing a couple of things today, actually, I was testing between Google Workspace and 365 and 365 and just a normal pop email that I've had since 2001. That that one with the pop email, it just went in and life was good and it said it's it's here. When, when I tried to send it to 365 or Google Workspace, it went no, 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 and bounced right. back. How many... What kind of percentage are we looking at in terms of, of people actually adopting DMARC from the email server perspective? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you look at it from a different perspective, you get different views, but with the major providers doing DMARC, um, the percentages are really high. I think in the United States, it's like, you know, 80 something plus percentage of mailboxes are covered. But if you move outside okay. of the United States into countries that have, you know, established players that are not gmail or not microsoft the adoption is is far far less when you look at individual operators um it really comes down to if someone's patching their machines and they're operating their machinery as uh not as a hobbyist but they're actively maintaining their email server chances are they've done dmark because that's why they're running their own but if you look at it from a hosting provider uh, perspective there are a lot of hosted VMs that have built-in software packages that will run an email server that has nothing to do with DMARC whatsoever. And it's never, it's not going to yes. change until packaged admins make it single click easy for, for this, for this work to get done. And that means there's a lot of technical work to get to push button simplicity for DMARC to work in a hosted environment where VMs are, are, are the rule. So it really, it really depends upon context. Um, in, South Africa, I'm unsure what the what the numbers look like in terms of where most mailboxes are being hosted. Uh, it, it might, you know, you can go down the list and say, okay, let's get the big players and then get to the long tail. The the long tail for hmm. mailbox providers supporting DMARC, it almost starts to mirror the long tail of internet domain owners. They, they end up being not very sophisticated. You know, DNS itself is already a technology that most people stay far away from if they if they can, because you have to cut paste records mm. and you know, heaven forbid you you do a typo and things light on fire, right? Like it, it's yes. terrifying for most people. So those are the barriers that if you wanted to see widespread adoption anywhere, once you get past the the large providers, that, that that's where it's at. Okay, okay. So I think I think we've covered everything and we've we've introduced a whole lot of more whole lot more acronyms and and abbreviations so i'm quite excited about that um all the additional information will be in the show notes um which we'll link to at the bottom of the um podcast but one last question where can people reach out to you tim oh you can find me at tim at demartian.com that's the best way perfect perfect thank you so much for taking the time out of your day and i uh, Really appreciate everything you've done for the DMARC industry, for the internet industry, and well done on being just that ah, cool. Thanks, Paul. I'm even more fun in real <laughs> life. So if you ever have a party in South Africa and you need, like, you know, not an ice sculpture, but someone like me to take the place of an ice sculpture, I'm, I'm really great. I like martinis. Um, so okay. all you have to do is... As long as, as long as you do it naked, as long as you do it naked, then, then I'm I mean, on board. That goes without saying. So just get that part <laughs> together, just do a little pedestal. If it rotates, that's even better. <laughs> Rotating pedestal with your naked body. Okay, okay. This this podcast went downhill very quickly. Thank you so right. much, Tim. Good luck salvaging at least five or ten good minutes out of this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Cheers, take man. care, Paul.